Hey guys, and welcome back to part two of this presentation. So another test that is frequently ordered from the hematology blood test is the mean corpuscular volume. And that normal value is between 79 and 95 femtoliters. Yes, femtoliters, that is the unit. And the mean corpuscular volume is the average size of the red blood cells in the specimen. And it is elevated or decreased in accordance with the average red blood cell size. So basically, a low MCV indicates a microcytic or a small average red blood cell size. A normal MCV indicates a normocytic or a normal average red blood cell size. And a high MCV indicates a macrocytic or a large average red blood cell size. And the mean corpuscular volume or MCV is actually a very useful tool used to classify the type of anemia the patient have and this can be based solely on the red blood cell morphology so as i mentioned earlier the normal value is 79 to 95 and i took this example from a textbook uh, the table below the normal values that i've given you in the table and that has been listed throughout this presentation is actually from the local clinic that i work at so these values will differ from hospital to hospital and they may be slightly different but around the same range so as you can see i took this table from a textbook and uh, their values were between 80 to 100 their normal values so not that far off from mine which are 79 to 95 it depends on the the laboratory so in the example below you can see the normal cytic or the normal red blood cell size, the volume of it. And again, that's between 79 and 95 femtoliters. And when the red blood cell is too large, it's called a macrocytic cell. And that's any value over 95 femtoliters. And when it's shrinked up or smaller, it's called a microcytic red blood cell. And that's any value below 79 femtoliters. So in the description, it states that the mean corpuscular volume can essentially be used to diagnose the specific type of anemia the patient may have. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So a microcytic MCV or a mean corpuscular volume, which is anything below 79 femtoliters, can diagnose any patient with a microcytic anemia. And what are examples of microcytic anemia? So microcytic anemias include the thalassemias, anemia of a chronic disease, an iron deficiency anemia, lead poisoning, or sideroblastic anemia. So if you have, for example, an iron deficiency anemia, you actually have a microcytic anemia. So if we come back to this slide, you'll see here that if you had an iron deficiency or thalassemia, this is what your red blood cell would essentially look like. Very small, very tiny, microcytic less than 79 femtoliters. And for the microcytic anemias, we can use a mnemonic, which is TAILS, and that's thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease, iron deficiency, L for lead poisoning, and S for sideroblastic anemia. We can also use the mean corpuscular volume to diagnose a macrocytic anemia, which means that the patient will have an increased MCV so going back to our slide here, we can see an increased MCV, which essentially means a very large red blood cell. This is what it looks like. So examples of macrocytic anemias are a folate deficiency anemia, a vitamin B12 deficiency anemia, a anemia caused by liver disease, hemolytic anemias, Anemias caused by hypothyroidism, excessive alcohol intake, aplastic anemia, and myelodysplastic syndrome. So if you remember, we also mentioned that the normal size of the red blood cell is called a normocytic cell. And patients may also develop a normocytic anemia, even though their mean corpuscular volume is between the normal range of 79 to 95 femtoliters, they can have an anemia due to a different cause. And these anemias are caused by chronic disease, acute blood loss, hemolytic anemia, such as autoimmune hemolytic anemia, hereditary 
spherocytosis or non-spherocytic congenital hemolytic anemia, which is a G6PD deficiency, anemia of the renal disease or aplastic anemia. So the last test related to the red blood cells is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration or the MCHC and that normal value is between 32 to 36 grams per deciliter and basically the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is the average concentration of hemoglobin in the red blood cells. So if you remember earlier I mentioned that the hemoglobin is a protein that is found within the red blood cells and the MCHC is calculated by multiplying the amount of hemoglobin, which is the amount of protein, by 100 and then dividing that number by the amount of packed red blood cells. The normal value for the MCHC is between 32 to 36 grams per deciliter and a low MCHC can be caused by blood loss over time, too little iron in the body, and a hypochromic anemia. So what are the causes of a high MCHC? A high MCHC will be any values over 36 grams per deciliter and causes of a high MCHC include spherocytosis, having too little vitamin B12 or having too little folic acid in the body. And something to note here is that the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration or the MCHC is actually responsible for making the blood look darker or less darker. So a high MCHC will give the blood a more darker color and a lower MCHC will give the blood a, a less intense color. So now we're going to move on to the platelets. The platelets are also called thrombocytes and their normal value is between 150,000 to 400,000 per microliter. So the platelets are tiny blood cells that help your body form clots to stop bleeding. If one of your blood cells gets damaged, it sends out signals that are picked up by platelets. The platelets then rush to the site of the damage and form a plug or a clot to repair the damage. The process of spreading across the surface of a damaged blood vessel to stop the bleeding is called adhesion. This is because when platelets get to the site of the injury, they grow sticky tentacles that help them adhere. They also send out chemicals to attract more platelets to pile onto the clot in a process called aggregation. So as you can see here, we have a blood vessel and that has been ruptured, so the patient is bleeding out. And what the platelets do, so there are these little blood cells that rush to the surface of that injury in the vessel, the blood vessel, and they help to glue this area that has been ruptured back together. So as you can see here, they're little tentacles that they've grown and they're recruiting more platelets, they're sending out some chemical messengers to recruit more of them so that they can form a plug here and stop that bleeding from occurring. So again, that normal value for the platelets are 150,000 to 400,000 per microliter. So a high platelet count is often called thrombocytosis. So thrombocytosis means a platelet value of more than 400,000 per microliter. And causes of thrombocytosis include cancer, most commonly lung, gastrointestinal, ovarian, breast or lymphomas, anemia, in particular iron deficiency anemia and hemolytic anemia, inflammatory conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis, infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, if an individual has had their spleen removed surgically or has undergone a splenectomy, they can have an increased number of platelets. The use of birth control pills, which are oral contraceptives. And some conditions can cause temporary or transitory increased platelet count. And this may be due to the recovery from significant blood loss, such as from a trauma or a major surgery, after some physical activity or exertion and recovery from excess alcohol consumption and vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. So this was about thrombocytosis. Now let's talk a little bit about thrombocytopenia or a low platelet count. And a low 
Platelet count would mean anything below the values of 150,000 platelets per microliter. And these causes include disorders in which the bone marrow cannot produce enough platelets, such as idiopathic thrombocytopenia, also known as immune thrombocytopenic purpura, which is the result of an antibody production against platelets, viral infections such as mononucleosis, hepatitis, HIV or measles, certain drugs such as aspirin, ibuprofen, some antibiotics, colchicine and endomethacine, H2 blockers, hydralazine, isinicide, quinidine, thiazide diuretics, and torbutamide are just a few that have been associated with drug-induced decreased platelet counts. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia results in, in low platelets when a person who is on or receive heparin therapy develops an antibody. Leukemia, lymphoma, or other cancers that are spread or metastasized to the bone. Sepsis, especially by a serious bacterial infection with gram-negative bacteria. Liver cirrhosis, which will cause portal hypertension and which will cause hypersplenism and therefore increase platelet destruction. Autoimmune disorders such as lupus, where the body's immune system produces antibodies that attack its own organs or tissues, causing an increased destruction of platelets. Chemo or radiation therapy, which may affect the bone marrow's ability to produce platelets. Platelet consumption may be observed in various diseases and conditions. For example, DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation, thrombocytopenic purpura, and hemolytic uremic syndrome, which can result in fewer circulating platelets in the blood. A low platelet count or thrombocytopenia can also be caused by an exposure to toxic chemicals such as pesticides, arsenic, or benzene. So this was actually quite a long list indeed. These are all causes for thrombocytopenia. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the white blood cells and as I mentioned earlier there are five different types of white blood cells mainly the neutrophils, the lymphocytes, the eosinophils, monocytes and basophils and they make up specific percentages of the white blood cells in the body and usually the neutrophils make up about 40 to 75 percent of all white blood cells and on the top right corner you can see a picture of what the neutrophil actually looks like and in the diagram on the left you can see the neutrophil uh, chasing around little uh, bacteria, and that's uh, in dark black they're very tiny but you can see the neutrophil is chasing them down and ingesting them and destroying them so the neutrophils are a type of phagocyte which means a cell that eats and destroys and are normally found in the bloodstream during the beginning or the acute phase of inflammation particularly as a result of bacterial infection, environmental exposure, and some cancers. Neutrophils are one of the first responders of the inflammatory cells to migrate towards the site of inflammation. They migrate through the blood vessels, then through the interstitial tissue, following chemical signals such as interleukin-8, C5A, FMLP, leukotriene, B4, and H2O2 in a process called chemotaxis. They are the predominant cells in pus, accounting for its whitish, yellowish appearance. So basically all that means is the neutrophils are usually recruited by the body's messaging system. The body sends out some chemical signals, which are called the interleukines, and they actually attract the neutrophils to the site where bacteria or infection or any kind of inflammation is occurring. And that is how the neutrophils occur at the area or the site they are required to be in. So if we have a high number of neutrophils, meaning a value over 75%, it's called neutrophilia. And this occurs when we have a bacterial infection most commonly because neutrophils are usually responsible for destroying and killing bacteria. Neutrophils can also be increased in any kind of acute inflammation so they will be raised after a heart attack or an infarct or burns. Some drugs such as prednisone have the same effect as cortisol and adrenaline, which is epinephrine, which can cause marginated neutrophils to enter the bloodstream and cause neutrophilia. 
Nervousness was also very slightly raised the neutrophil account. Neutrophilia can also be the result of a malignancy such as chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML or chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a disease where the blood cells proliferate out of control. Neutrophilia can also be caused by a splenectomy and primary neutrophilia can additionally be the result of a leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So now that we've covered neutrophilia, which is an increased amount of those neutrophils in the bloodstream, we're going to talk about neutropenia, which is the lower than normal level of neutrophils in the bloodstream. And neutropenia can be caused by a problem in the production of neutrophils in the bone marrow, the destruction of neutrophils outside the bone marrow, infections, and a nutritional deficiency. There are also some specific causes of decreased production of neutrophils, which include being born with a problem of the bone marrow production, which can be a congenital condition, leukemia, and other conditions that affect the bone marrow or lead to a bone marrow failure, radiation or chemotherapy. We can also have neutropenia due to infections, and these can be caused by tuberculosis or dengue fever. We can also have viral infections such as Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, HIV or viral hepatitis that causes neutropenia. Also an increased destruction of neutrophils, which can be due to the body's immune system targeting neutrophils for destruction. And this may be related to an autoimmune condition such as Crohn disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus erythematosus. In some people, neutropenia can also be caused by certain medications such as antibiotics, blood pressure drugs, psychiatric drugs, and epilepsy drugs. So another type of white blood cell is the lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes normally make up 20 to 45% of normal white blood cells in the bloodstream. And what is a lymphocyte? A lymphocyte is one of the subtypes of white blood cells in our immune system. Lymphocytes include natural killer cells, known as NK cells, T cells, and B cells. They are the main type of cell found in the lymph, which is why they are called lymphocytes. So at the bottom, there's just pictures of what the different types of lymphocytes look like. Here we have the natural killer cells. Here we have the T cells, which are two types. They're cytotoxic and helper, and we have the B cells. So these are all types of lymphocytes, which are types of white blood cells. So an increased number of lymphocytes is called lymphocytosis because if you remember that normal value is between 20 to 45 percent so anything above 45 percent of lymphocytes in the bloodstream will be called lymphocytosis. Lymphocytosis can be caused by infections which is usually viral or a chronic bacterial infection, infectious mononucleosis such as the Epstein-Barr virus, and mononucleosis syndrome, cat scratch disease and other chronic bacterial infections, taxoplasmosis, drug hypersensitivity reactions, stress, persistent polyclonal B cell lymphocytosis, post splenectomy, which means after the spleen has been removed, having a thymoma. We can also have monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, which is just lymphocytosis of a specific cell, which is the B cell lymphocyte. We can also have lymphoproliferative disease of large glandular lymphocytes, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So the opposite of lymphocytosis is lymphopenia. And lymphopenia means the value of white blood cells represented by lymphocytes being below the value of 20%. And some acquired causes of lymphopenia are infectious diseases such as HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, and typhoid fever, autoimmune disorders such as lupus, steroid therapy, blood cancer, and other blood diseases such as Hodgkin's disease and aplastic anemia, and radiation and chemotherapy. Some inherited causes of lymphocytopenia include the George anomaly, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, and severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome and ataxia telangiectasia. So now we're going to speak about the monocytes. The monocytes are a type of white blood cell that fights certain infections 
and help other white blood cells remove dead or damaged tissues, destroy cancer cells, and regulate immunity against foreign substances. Monocytes are produced in the bone marrow and then enter the blood. After a few hours in the blood, they migrate to tissues such as the spleen, the liver, the lungs, and the bone marrow tissue, where they mature into macrophages. So this is what a monocyte looks like, and eventually it matures into a macrophage. So again, the normal value of the monocytes is 0 to 12%. An increased number of monocytes, which means a value of more than 12% represented by monocytes, is called monocytosis, and it occurs in response to chronic infections, in autoimmune disorders, in blood disorders, and in certain cancers. An increased number of macrophages in parts of the body other than in the blood, such as the lungs, skin, and other organs, can occur in response to infections, sarcoidosis, and Langerhans cell histocytosis. So now that we know what causes monocytosis or an increased number of monocytes, let's talk a little bit about a decreased number of monocytes. So something to note is that if we don't pick up any monocytes on the blood analysis, it's okay because the normal value of monocytes is between 0 to 12%. But there are some pathological conditions which can cause a decreased number of monocytes, and that is called monocytopenia. And the causes of monocytopenia are anything that decreases the overall white blood cell count, such as causes for neutropenia and lymphocytopenia, such as a bloodstream infection, chemotherapy, or a bone marrow disorder. People with certain skin infections and some people with human papilloma virus infections of the genitals can also have a low number of monocytes. The eosinophils. So the eosinophils account for 0 to 5% of the normal value of white blood cells in the blood. And the eosinophils are a type of white blood cell that play an important role in the body's response to allergic reactions, asthma, and infections with parasites. Sometimes eosinophils can cause inflammation in certain organs and result in symptoms. So now let's talk a little bit about a high number of eosinophils, which will be a value more than 5%, and that is called eosinophilia or hyper eosinophilia. And the causes are allergic disorders, an infection by a parasite, certain cancers, allergic disorders including asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, and eczema. Many parasites, particularly that invade the tissue, can cause eosinophilia too. Cancers that can cause eosinophilia include Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, and the myeloproliferative disorders. A low number of eosinophils in blood is called eosinopenia, and this can occur in Cushing syndrome, bloodstream infections, such as sepsis, and treatment with corticosteroids. However, a low number of eosinophils does not usually cause problems because other parts of the immune system can compensate adequately. And this is why we can say that the normal value for eosinophils is anywhere between 0 to 5. So even if the eosinophils are absent in your blood test or if they have a very low value, it's nothing really to panic about. So the last test in the hematology section of the blood test include the basophils. This is the last type of white blood cell. And the normal value for basophils are between 0 to 2%. And the basophils are a type of white blood cell that have some role in the immune surveillance, such as detecting and destroying very early cancers. And they also play a part in wound repair. Basophils can also release histamine and other mediators and play a role in the initiation of allergic reactions. So now let's talk about the values of basophils. So a decrease in the normal number of basophils is called basopenia, and this can occur in response to thyrotoxicosis, acute hypersensitivity reactions, and infections. An increased amount of basophils in the body can occur in people with hypothyroidism, and in myeloproliferative disorders, such as polycythemia vera and myelofibrosis, in which marked increases in the number of basophils can occur. So that concludes the presentation on the hematology part of the blood test. I hope you guys found this presentation very informative. As I mentioned earlier, I will be doing separate videos on the biochemical blood tests as well as the liver and kidney function tests.
So thank you for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe and share. And if you would like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and see you guys soon.